Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, hopefully, most of you joined us for the uh, webinar we went over last month, and this is a continuation of talking about humanized mice. And uh, so let's jump right into it. But before I do that, I always like to remind everyone a little bit about the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, we are a nonprofit research institution, and our mission is to discover precise genomic solutions for disease and empower the global biomedical community in the shared quest to improve, improve human health. And we do that not only by distributing mouse models of human disease for which researchers can use in their research, but what a lot of people don't know is we provide a lot of services, in vitro services, in vivo services, uh, mouse creation, uh, mouse characterization studies, custom breeding projects. And we do, as will be abundantly clear by this presentation, is we work with the biotech and the pharmaceutical industries where they can send us their new therapeutics and we can run those drugs through our immuno-oncology platforms at our facility in Sacramento. So we have multiple uh, locations around the world serving everyone around the world globally. And uh, so please get in touch with us if you have any questions about some of the services that we offer. Okay, so why humanized mice? And when I'm talking about humanized mice, I'm talking about in the context of these very complex animal models that are both genetically modified to express human growth factors, but also transplanted with either human hematopoietic stem cells or human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So I think most of us that are attending today are well aware of the fact that the uh, there's been a huge expansion in immuno-oncology drug development over the last three to five years. Now, in order to better serve this drug development process, we really need more predictive models with improved clinical translation. We also must include genetic diversity to better model human diversity of response. Now, the black six mice, the BALBCs, these syngenetic models are very powerful tools. They're outstanding for helping us figure out mechanisms of mechanism of action, doing proof of principle experiments, and working out the scientific details to develop these new human-specific molecules. But unfortunately, they're basically a patient of one. And the beauty of these humanized mice is they actually capture this human diversity by this diversity of the, the donor cell populations that are going into these mice. The other important thing is that we're really actually working with a human immune system, not the mouse's immune system, to better capture human biological responses. And we're looking at uh, drug development to human-specific targets to capture the affinity, avidity, and mode of action with those human-specific targets within the mouse tissues, uh, the tumor, excuse me, the mouse uh, the human tumors and the human immune system. So you don't have to create mouse specific reagents first and then recreate them again for the human. You can create human specific reagents first and test them in this humanized mouse model. Now, the last point is an in vivo system we feel is extremely important, and I'll show you some evidence to support this later in the talk, to capture the systemic and the holistic consequences of toxicity, both in terms of cytokine release and adverse immune responses. So there's a number of mouse models that I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm only gonna go into them in partial detail because we dedicated a whole webinar a month ago to all these different topics, but I'm gonna go through some reminders with you. So the main four that we have at the top here, these three, the NSG, the IL-15 and the SGM-3, we're regularly engrafting on a monthly basis with hematopoietic stem cells. The NSG class one, class two double knockout is primarily being used for PBMC engraftment. We have two new models, which is a cross between the SGM3 and the IL-15. This is an F1 hybrid to capture the best of both of those and expand the innate immune function. And then we have another new model that we'll be rolling out this year too, which has a knockout of the mouse FLT3 receptor and as a transgene expressing the human FLT3 ligand to improve myeloid and dendritic cells. 
So the first half of my talk today, I'll be talking about the applications of the hematopoietic stem cell humanized platforms and how they're being used in drug discovery. And then the second half, we'll talk about the PBMC models. So again, the first three that I'll talk about are the NSG, the SGM3, and the IL-15. The NSG is a great model, uh, has ex excellent human T cell responses. It is capable of multi-lineage engraftment. You can detect all these different cell populations. However, the numbers of NK cells and myeloid cells are low in both frequency and number. So we have a mouse called the SGM3. Uh, this is a mouse that is expressing human IL-3, CSF2 or GMCSF, and kit ligand or stem cell factor to better, better support the somatopoiesis, drive more myeloid production, and also uh, enhances the, the T cell population and the regulatory T cell population. Uh, both of these strains uh, have a low abundancy of fully mature natural killer cells. So Lenny Schultz has created this NSG IL-15 transgenic mouse expressing hu human IL-15 from a, a, a back that was inserted into the genome, making physiological levels of IL-15 and improving natural killer cell development. So the uh, SGM3 IL-15 F1 hybrid includes, as I said a moment ago, the best of the enhancements of both the SGM3 and the IL-15. The one that's really quite different is this FLT3 uh, uh, receptor knockout uh, and transgenic human FLT3 ligand expressor. FLT3 ligand is a molecule that stimulates very early in early hematopoiesis. It's also important for those myeloid and lymphoid uh, multipotent progenitor populations and enhances myeloid development, dendritic cell development, and a lot of other cell populations. Uh, so it's a really exciting new uh, platform for us. So this is a chart that really kind of summarizes the differences in these mouse models. And the way I've got this organized here is that the lighter green has the least number of those cells, but they're present. If it becomes a little bit darker green, there's more of those cells. And when it's dark green, uh, it's the most uh, populated with that particular cell population. And so what you can see with the NSG is the base model. It's got T cells, it's got T regs, and it's got all these other cell populations at low frequency. What I also wanna point out here is this orange color was as it refers to B cells. All of these platforms have CD19, CD20 positive B cells, but the function of those B cells is at this point in time limited in terms of being able to class switch, be sent, sent, uh, activated to make IgG and those kinds of things. And that's an active area of research. The SGM3 has increased T cells and T regs and also has increased myeloid cells, mast cells, and conventional dendritic cells. And there's more and more papers coming out uh, all the time on the ability to use this model for mast cells. The IL-15, if you really dig into this, the really only major difference between this model and the NSG is it has improved numbers and frequencies of, of natural killer cells. So it's a very good T and NK cell model. The SGM3 IL-15, again, improved T cells, T regs, NK cells, although the NK cells are a little bit lower than what you would find in the IL-15 because this is an F1 hybrid, so it's hemizygous for that transgene, and we believe that's why there are more NK cells compared to the NSG, but not as many as in this homozygous uh, NSG IL-15 mouse. And then finally, the FLT3 knockout has a lot of the same kind of improvements that you would see in terms of NK cells and myeloid cells as these other strains. But in particular, it really has an expansion of conventional and plasmacytoid dendritic cells. Uh, so the way that you choose these different platforms is based on your drug's mode of action and what kind of scientific question you want to ask. Okay. So let's begin with chapter one and let's talk about the ability to create these CD34 hematopoietic stem cell and grafted mice, put tumors on board and what happens and how can you modulate that immune system, particularly with monoclonal antibodies.
So the first question is, can you put tumors on board? Can you get them to grow? And do they infiltrate with immune cells? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are caveats to that, though. There is probably about 20% of the time there are tumors that are indeed outright inject, rejected and not grown on these mice. But about 80% of the time, you get really good growth curve characteristics. So in the red squares, we've got the humanized NSG. and In the green, we've got the regular non-engrafted NSG mice. And the growth curve kinetics are similar between this breast patient derived xenograft, this soft tissue carcinoma, and this lung PDX shown here. And we often get this question, well, why is it that these tumors are not rejected? And it's kind of a complicated answer. Uh, there's a lot of different things that are going on biologically, and some of which include that this is a pro-inflammatory environment in which these tumors are growing because there is an initial infiltration and, and an initial immune response of the immune cells to these tumors. And that inflammatory environment can lead to diminished HLA expression. There is a very well documented upregulation of checkpoint inhibitor pathways, PD1, PDL1, and a number of others, as you'll see in a few minutes. And there's also infiltration of regulatory T cells that can suppress immune function and a number of different myeloid cell populations, MDSCs, TAMs, other things that also have suppressor functions, just like those tumors that are collected from clinical samples and shown to have those types of activities as well. And so to take that a little bit further, this particular publication took some humanized NSG mice and they collected uh, a number of uh, uh, cell line derived human xenograft cell lines and then grafted them on the mice to look at what their growth curve kinetics are. So as you would expect, different tumors have different rates of growth and different ability to grow on these humanized mice, some very quickly, some very poorly. And then if you harvest those tumors at the end of the study, you can interrogate them for immune infiltrates. And you can see just like what is observed in human patient samples, there are cold tumors with very minimal human infiltrates and hot tumors that have very high numbers of immune infiltrating cells. But what's also interesting about this paper, and it has been really kind of uh, further reinforced by other researchers who agree with this study, and that is that if you take the same tumor and you put it on different donors and very, go back in and look at the frequency and the types of cells that infiltrate into that tumor across these multiple tumors, the level of T-cell infiltration, the level of myeloid infiltration seems to be being controlled by the tumor itself and not necessarily the donor. And that makes sense when you think about uh, chemokines, adhesion molecules, things like that, that are recruiting these cells to the tumor and allowing these cells to enter. Nevertheless, we are also seeing differences in response from different therape therapeutics based on the donor. So there's a, there's a lot going on that really kind of really nicely recapitulates a lot of what we're seeing uh, when clinical samples are interrogated. So the question is, can you interfere with checkpoint inhibitor pathways? The simple answer is yes. Here is an example of uh, humanized NSG co-engrafted with a triple negative breast cancer cell line that was engrafted into the mammary fat pad. You could see the untreated growth shown here. There's two different donors, donor A and donor B in these two different graphics. And then there, one arm was treated with prembolizumab and one arm was treated with nivolumab. These are both anti-PD-1 therapeutics that are clinically approved. And you can see that they suppress tumor growth in these models. The caveat to this is that we see this type of response approximately in about 30 to 35 percent of the time that we run those drugs across a panel of different, a large panel of donors. So just like in the clinic, there is, uh, you know, only about a 30 to 35 percent response rate. And people, this is an active area of research to figure out what is it about these donors that is causing a lack of response? And this paper begins to try to address some of that. Uh, this is a group of scientists who looked at the clinical data and they found a correlation between patients 
who have low frequency and low numbers of CD141 positive dendritic cells. So they did an initial experiment where they injected the mice with a combination of FLT3 ligand, which would expand the development of dendritic cells. And they also included poly-IC, which would stimulate the activation of those dendritic cells through the toll-like receptor 3. And then treated the mice with prembolizumab and showed an increased sensitivity of response to prembolizumab. They also did this experiment that's shown here in the same paper, where they used some of these mice that were treated with FLT3 ligand, pulled out their spleens, isolated those dendritic cells, put them in liquid culture, uh, and treated them with poly-IC to activate those dendritic cells. Saw a nice upregulation of both CD83 and CD40, indicating that these are activated dendritic cell populations. They took uh, some of these humanized NSG SGM3 mice that were engrafted with these uh, uh, tumors. And then they injected the mice with prembolizumab. And they also, at two different time points, injected the tumors with these CD141 positive dendritic cells. And it was only in that arm of mice that received those dendritic cells that showed a nice response to prembolizumab. And when they pulled out the tumors, they could see that in that subset of tumors that were treated with both prembolizumab and the CD141 dendritic cells, they had an increased frequency of human uh, CD8 positive T cells in that tumor, explaining why there was a decreased uh, expansion of the tumors in those mice. So the platforms can be used to figure out different methodologies to improve checkpoint inhibitor responses. Here's another interesting paper that looks at a different checkpoint pathway, and this one is STAT3. And the overall hypothesis for this particular paper was that following radiotherapy, there's cell death, of course, and uh, as these cells are dying, they release their double-stranded DNA, which can be an agonist for toll-like nine receptors, which can activate the myeloid compartment. These myeloid cells produce IL-6 and a number of other factors through activation of the STAT3 pathway. And when they do so, they uh, induce blood vessel formation and therefore tumor regrowth, explaining why after radiotherapy, some of these tumors will grow back. So they had a hypothesis that they could use uh, RNA antisense uh, oligonucleotides to interfere with the STAT3 pathway. And the way to better get those uh, antisense oligos to the cell is and specifically target them to the myeloid cell, cell population is hybridized to that molecule uh, uh, a dideoxynucleotide that would bind to those total like nine receptors and be pulled into the cell and deactivate the Im immunosuppressive expression pathway and activate the immunostimulatory pathway, essentially making these myeloid cells be M1 macrophages instead of M2 macrophages and having immunosuppressive phenotypes and get better responses to the tumor. So what you're looking at in this graphic over here on the left side of your screen is you have the first control, which is a CPG unmethylated oligodeoxynucleotide conjugated to a scrambled oligonucleotide. So you're just stimulating TLR9, but not blocking the STAT3 pathway. Then you have mice that were injected with just the STAT3 ASO. And then the other molecule, which is CPG attached to the STAT3 ASO. And if you look here, the red line is the tumor volume suppression using the, the molecule that 
is targeted specifically to the myeloid cells and blocking the STAT3 pathway. And if you collect the tumors at the end of the study and you interrogate the phenotypes of the immune cells infiltrating you and compare them to the other control populations, you have more CD8 positive T cells, more CD8, CD4 positive T cells in the tumor, and a decrease in the regulatory T cells in those tumors, therefore raising the CD8 to, to Treg ratio, switching the balance to cytotoxicity and away from uh, Treg mediated immunosuppression. Here's another paper that has taken a look at the upset or change of the balance within the tumor microenvironment of the Treg to CD8 ratio. The, this group developed a monoclonal antibody called MK4166. It is an anti-gitter monoclonal antibody. Gitter is a protein that's expressed on the surface of regulatory T cells. So this monoclonal antibody binds to those regulatory T cells. And the FTF C tail has the recognition components for CD16 so that uh, NK cells and macrophages can recognize that FC portion of the tail and they will clear those regulatory T cells with antibody attached through ADCC and ADCP. So they put tumor on board these mice, they used a human melanoma, and by treating with that monoclonal antibody, they saw suppression of tumor growth. They collected the remaining tumor that was left at the end of the study and looked at Tregs within that tumor and saw a decrease in the Treg frequency. And they also an saw uh, at the same time an increase in uh, interleukin-2 and interferon gamma, indicating that the T cells that were in remaining in that tumor were active and responding against the tumor. Here's another example of, the, in this case, this is a breast tumor. This is the MDA MB231 triple negative breast cancer. And here, this group was looking at a small molecule IDL1 inhibitor, uh, either alone or in combination with a valumab, which is an anti pdl one checkpoint blockade and uh, molecule, monoclonal antibody. Uh, just to orient you, when you have uh, increased IO1 enzyme activity in the antigen presenting cell population, you have decreased tryptophan in the environment, and therefore you have immune suppression of T cells. So if you block the enzyme activity, there's more tryptophan available, and you have better activity of the T cells. And shown here is a combination of Valumab and IDO1 showing the combination therapy had a superior suppression of uh, tumor growth in this model setup. Now let's switch over and talk a little bit about the uh, humanized IL-15 mouse and the natural killer cells that are being functionally improved in terms of their development frequency numbers, et cetera, in these mice. So if you take a melanoma PDX and grow it either on the NSG mice or the transgenic NSG mouse, in the absence of engraftment, the engraftment kinetics are exactly the same in both of these uh, pl host platforms. But now if you humanize and then put those tumors on board, you will see if you compare this open red box to the open circle, you could see that the development of those natural killer cells is partially suppressing the growth of those tumors on the flank of this mice. And we know that it's the natural killer cells because if you treat with OKT8, which is a CD8 depletion monoclonal antibody, you have no change in the growth kinetics and you don't change the frequency of NK cells in the tumor post CD8 depletion. However, if you treat those mice with anti-NKP46 to deplete those human NK cells that are being developed in that mouse, you increase the ability of those tumors to grow. So this is with all of the NK cells intact down here in the blue open squares. You deplete the NK cells and the tumor grows a little bit faster. And indeed, if you look in the tumor, there are, there are lower frequency of those NK cells in the tumor. And if you take an NK cell resistant dowdy tumor cell, which is a B cell lymphoma that expresses CD20 on its surface, and you treat with rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, this is a clinically improved molecule, 
you can see that if you treat these mice bearing these tumors with atruximab, you can show a decrease in the, the tumor uh, volume uh, on three different donors. So it was very donor consistent across this particular treatment. So to summarize our first chapter today, um, human immune engrafted mice are able to co-engraft either human tumor cell line derived xenografts or patient derived xenografts. Uh, we've taken a look at whether HLA types make a big difference in whether tumors are engrafted or rejected. And to date, uh, neither ourselves or anyone else who are, is working in this industry has been able to show a correlation between HLA types and growth tumor characteristics. Tumor immune cell infiltration is controlled by tumor intrinsic factors and tends to be very repeatable uh, across donors with a given tumor type. Engrafted human immune cell populations are responsive to monoclonal antibody therapeutics, and these therapeutics can be used to either upregulate or downregulate cellular immune responses. Human target specific clinically approved and experimental small molecules and monoclonal antibodies can be evaluated for efficacy and mechanism of action. So let's move on and, and talk a little bit about uh, bispecifics and their utility in being able to engage T cell populations and bring them into slow tumor growth. The first type of engager that I'm going to be talking about is the type that is termed a bite. And this is a specific type of bispecific where the small chain fragment variable region from a one monoclonal antibodies, in this case, which is specific to the CD3 molecule on the surface of a T cell, and another monoclonal antibody that was designed to have specificity to tumor-associated antigen. And there's a number of different uh, tumor target antigens that these are being created for. And these are covalently linked in a back-to-back -back fashion so that when they bind both of their uh, ligands, they pull the T cell into close proxi proximity with the target cell and the, and the T cells becomes activated and there's toxic granule release and killing of the activated, uh, killing of the target cell population. So this experiment that I'm going to be showing here is an EGFR by CD3 bispecific. These are humanized NSG mice that have been grafted with a triple negative breast cancer uh, and grafted orthotopically in the uh, memory fat pad. So this is an orthotopic tumor. And there's two ways in which the study was done. It was a prophylactic trial and a therapeutic trial. And what that means is basically small tumors versus large tumors and really starts to address the question of tumor burden and the ability of these bispecifics to respond. And also taking a look at cytokine release, both to get an idea of activation of the cells, mechanism of action, but also in terms of um, uh, cytotoxicity and organ toxicity. Uh, we also did look at the T cells in the peripheral blood and looked at activation markers. In the interest of time, I'm not going to show you that specific set of data, but just to make a long story short, we did see uh, upregulation of CD69 and CD25 on C4 and CD8 cells uh, after dosing with this bispecific. So the top row here is the prophylactic trial, basically just started dosing uh, of the mice when the tumors were smaller at about 100 millimeters cubed. In the therapeutic trial, we waited till the tumors were larger, somewhere around, well, greater than 200. So some of them were 300 to 400 millimeters cubed when they were rolled into the study. So these are the individual mice here, and this is the average data. And what you can see is that uh, there were multiple doses given every three days. And then the last dose was at 14 days. And you could see that it very nicely suppressed the growth of these tumors. Uh, when we look at the cytokines, what's interesting is that the, the, the highest levels of cytokine release were in after the early initial doses of the bispecific, indicating that there was a very large amount of tumor lysis going on and there was a larger cytokine release. And once you got down to the later stages, uh, when there was less tumor burden, there were less uh, tumor lysis going on, and there was less cytokine release 
following that. So each time there was a dose at day one, three, five, eight, et cetera, about 16 hours after that dosage of the bispecific collected blood and looked for human specific uh, cytokines in the peripheral blood. And so both of these platforms showed a similar type of profile where the magnitude of the cytokine release was associated with the magnitude of amount of tumor burden uh, still remaining in the mouse. So here's a really nice paper that was put out by the Roche team, who is very active in developing bispecific antibodies. Uh, their approach to the bispecific is a little bit different. They developed something called a T-cell bispecific, and the structure of their molecule is very different than some of the traditional monoclonal antibodies and different than those bite molecules I just introduced to you. Here, this particular molecule has two CD20 binding arms out at the very end, and the CD3 binding portion is internal to one of the arms. Now, one of the reasons that is also different is they include the FC tail that's been modified, and the modifications are to remove uh, uh, interaction with uh, 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 myeloid cells and uh, natural killer cells so that there aren't any off-target immune responses, but also it retains binding to FCRN. And the importance of doing that is to improve the overall half-life and improve the bioavailability of the molecule. Now, they were creating this molecule because they, you know, even though they've already had this obinutuzumab, also known as Gaziva, this particular molecule is effective, but it is not as good at fully clearing out uh, the tumor as we'll see in just a moment. So in this first set of data that I'm gonna show you is really taking a look at what happens when you take a humanized NSG mouse, which has lots of normal B cells being developed. So this is in the absence of any tumor put on board yet. And just treating the mice with the CD20 TCB I showed you on the previous slide, and just ask the question, can this molecule deplete the B cells in the peripheral blood of this mouse? And the answer is yes. Um, but what's also interesting, during this depletion of the B cells, there is a pretty strong cytokine release early on, shortly after treating those mice. So there's a cytotoxic uh, cytokine release type of syndrome during this active phase of killing of those B cells in the model that can lead to a brief T cell cytopenia and then those T cells bounce back. So this gives you an indication that there's good clearance and good response, good mechanism of action, but there's also this concern about a cyto cytokine release type of response. So to try to make a long story short here, they came, they, they treated the mice with tumors, which further increased the, the uh, target burden. So there's both the B cells in the humanized mice and uh, a B cell lymphoma. This is the B cell lymphoma that they used here. So there's lots of tumor target here. So if they treat with the CD20 TCB alone, they get good clearance of tumor. But again, remember, they're getting a very high cytokine release response in that setting. If you treat with Gaziva, the, the other clinically approved molecule that they have, you don't get as good tumor clearance, but as I'll show you in the next slide, there's very minimal cytokine release with that particular molecule. And so what they did is they came up with a strategy where they would pre-treat with Gaziva, and then they would follow up with additional treatments with the CD20 TCB. And the overall goal of this was to use the Gaziva molecule to decrease the tumor burden. And so when they came in with the second treatment, they could clear out the tumor and decrease the risk of cytokine release. And that's what we're looking at here. So this is the vehicle uh, treated groups, the controls. If we do two doses of the CD20 TCB, the first dose under high tumor burden, lots of cytokine release with multiple different human cytokines being released. Uh, when the tumor burden goes down and you give them a second treatment with the same antibody, not as much uh, cytokine release. Uh, here, if you treat with Gaziva, you don't have that cytokine release, even under that high tumor burden. You come in with a second Gaziva treatment, still no cytokine release. And then here is the interesting one where you treat with, they, they treated with Gaziva first, got the tumor burden down, came in with a second 
series of treatments with this CD20 TCB and show that this was a much safer approach for the patient as they moved into the clinical trials. So in summary for chapter two, uh, human immune and grafted mice co-transplanted with human tumors allow preclinical evaluation of human target-specific bispecific antibodies. Bispecific antibodies are highly effective in directing and grafted human CD3 positive T cells toward cytotoxic anti-tumor activity. Tumor cytotoxic response is associated with T cell activation, cytopenia, and high cytokine release in the high tumor burden setting. So now let's change over and talk about the peripheral blood mononuclear cell and grafted platforms and how they can be used for drug discovery. So there's two different platforms that you can engraft with hematopoietic, uh, excuse me, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. This is a regular NSG. And if you do really, really short term studies, maybe only five or six days, you could do really quick studies. Uh, but one of the problems is that these mice, particularly when they're uh, irradiated to accelerate engraftment, they will get xenogeneic graft versus host disease very, very quickly. And you can express a lot of molecules, pro-inflammatory molecules. The mice become ill very quickly. Your timelines are very short. And it kind of complicates your studies a little bit. So Mike Bram, uh, Dale Greiner, and Lenny Schultz created this mouse shown here. This is, very simply put, there are uh, multiple alleles that are modified in this mouse, but ultimately what it's doing, it's knocking out the mouse MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules. So there's less antigen presentation and less ability to activate those PBMCs as they go into the mouse. And so if you compare five days after PBMC engraftment in the irradiated mice, you will see that at five days, the immune cells are about five or six percent. And if you follow this by day 10, this is up to around 40 percent and progresses after that. Um, the total human population is down here around six percent at five days, as I said. And within that population, you've got mostly CD3 T cells, but you also have B cells, myeloid cells and natural killer cells. And the engraftment uh, characteristics between those two is very, very similar. But what is different is that in the NSG mice shown in blue, is those cells become activated very quickly. They start attacking the tissues. The mice begin losing body weight, and they need to be sacrificed based on IACUC protocols to relieve those mice. Whereas the class one, class two double knockout mice remain healthy uh, and have longer term survival, providing you with a longer window of opportunity. Now, these mice are not devoid of graft versus host disease. The cells do become activated, but you have a longer and more time of which you can use these mice on experiments with less complicating factors. So let's talk about some of the interesting things that you can do. So you can, uh, obviously engraft these mice with PBMCs. You can co-inject them with labeled tumors. In this case, these are liquid tumors, B-cell, T-cell lymphomas, those kinds of things with luciferase and or GFP tags. And then you could treat those mice with bispecifics or monoclonal antibodies to get those uh, human immune cells to respond against the tumor. Now you could do this, uh, this is a very flexible model, depending on the tumor that you're working with. Let's say, for example, you're working actually with solid tumors. You may want to engraft the solid tumors first to radiate later, or maybe you don't want the influence of radiation on your tumor at all. You would completely leave out the radiation and you can engraft the PBMCs that way. So how you run the model depends on what tumor you're working with and those kinds of things. You can also do CAR-Ts this way. And so you can take a, a population of peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and you can take a subfraction of those cells, inject them into the mice, take another subfraction and create uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. You can co-inject them with a labeled liquid tumor, or you can put solid tumors on their flank. And then you can in introduce your CAR Ts and look for the ability of those CAR Ts to respond against the tumor, whether that be liquid tumors or solid tumors. So this is an instance of using PBMC and grafted mice. Here we're do looking at an EGFR by CD3 bispecific. And what we've done here is we've taken uh, a MDA-MB231 cell 
line. This is a single cell suspension that's been transduced to express luciferase. So this is a cell disseminated model where the tumor was injected IV. So it's throughout the body of the mouse and through the bloodstream. And treating those mice with either just anti-CD28 monoclonal antibody, Keytruda, also known as Pembolizumab or an anti-PD1 monoclonal antibody, to see if that induced the T-cell populations to respond against the tumor. Uh, the EGFR bispecific by itself, or a combination of the EGFR uh, CD3 bispecific plus the Keytruda. So uh, in the instance of where we're seeing tumor outgrowth here, what we think is happening here, and what we've seen this with uh, other anti-CD8-28 treatments, it not only activates the T cells, but it can lead to activation-induced cell death and loss of T cells, which we think is explaining why um, there's an outgrowth of the tumor uh, in this particular arm of the study. The Keytruda uh, did not have any impact on tumor growth as shown in green here, but whenever you had the, the bispecific, you saw suppression of tumor growth uh, as shown here. And these are the individual mice and how they responded. But what we were, one of the goals of this study was really to also tie this to the cytokine release response and its associated toxicity in the overall health and well-being of the mouse. And what's really interesting here is that if you include an arm where there's no tumor injected, but you include, for example, the bispecifics, if there's a bispecific but no tumor target, there's no cytokine release, either two or six hours or beyond that afterward. It's only in the presence of when you have tumor and you've engaged those T cells to respond against those tumors, become activated, release its granules, that you have release of interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and a number of other cytokines. In this particular study, we did not see any further enhancement of activity by, by uh, co-treating with Keytruda. But what's very important is you can use these in vivo models to also tell you something about what does this cytokine release mean to the overall health of the animal? Is it something the mouse can recover from or is it a transitory response? And you can measure that by doing something by what we call collecting clinical scores, which looks at mo mobility of the mouse, body temperature, pilation of the skin, redness of the skin, uh, and, and a number of other things to have this accumulative clinical, clinical score. And you can see that only in these groups that had high cytokine release that you see this accumulated high clinical scores that correlated very nicely with a drop in mean body weight. But these clinical scores came down and body weight recovered in these mice, indicating that this high cytokine release in this particular setting was transitory in nature. Now these anti-CD28 mice began losing late mice losing body weight late because of the expansion of the tumor. And so this is a tumor volume or tumor expansive illness due to the expansion of those tumor, and which also correlates with the accumulation of poor clinical scores here. All right. So let's take another look at using a, a CD19 by CD3 by specific. Uh, against the same kind of tumor. Uh, and what we're looking at here, uh, I'm sorry, not the same kind of tumor, I beg your pardon. This is looking at the NSG MHC class one, class two double knockout, uh, PBMC humanized mice, where you can get a CD19 by CD3 by specific. And we're looking at a Raji tumor that's been colon grafted. So this is a B cell lymphoma. And what we're doing here is using that by specific under multiple doses to do a dose ranging study, to take a look at both tumor response and take a look at cytokine release response across multiple donors. So what we've got here is we've got five different donors. And as we move from left to right, we're increasing the concentration of the bispecific given to these recipient animals. And what you can see very clearly is there are very big differences in donor-specific responses. 
So donor number or letter C, which is shown here in blue, and donor E, that is shown here in purple, are very high cytokine releasers in this context. And they increase the amount of cytokine that's released as you increase the dose of the bispecific. So this is human interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and interleukin-6. But what you also see here is there's three different donors, E, F, and G, which are low cytokine releasers. And they seem to be intrinsic to these particular leukopacks. If we compare that data to the tumor response data, we can see very quickly uh, very different differences in donor response. So in other words, if you just because you have high cytokine release doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have good tumor response. So if you remember from the previous slide, donor C and donor E were high cytokine releasers in this context. This particular donor did not have a good tumor response, even at the highest doses, where this one was a high cytokine releaser, but had really good responses here. However, but then there's also the instance where you've got a low cytokine releaser as shown in D and very good response. And this indicates here that this particular donor probably could even receive higher doses of the bispecific without the risk of toxic cytokine release and have yet an even better response against the tumor. So this is very informative information and helps us really kind of tease apart what exactly is it that's different between these different donors and, and to try to get at some of those questions. Because we're seeing this uh, very commonly in the clinic as well. But what about reproducibility? So what our innovation team did is took donor E and did two experiments with it, and donor F, which was a low cytokine releaser, and did two, two experiments uh, with it. And these two experiments were done about two months apart and just fresh dilution of the uh, PBMCs, fresh engraftment, all those kinds of things. And what you can see is as you repeat those, that dose response study, uh, the particular leukopack responded again with high cytokine release, and the low one was with low cytokine release. And if we look at the efficacy data with donor E, which was the high cytokine releaser, uh, again, the same level of suppression of tumor growth in the high cytokine releaser and the same repeatable type of activity in the low cytokine releaser. So it's not an artifact of the studies. This is highly reproducible. All right. What about um, CAR-T? In this particular experiment, we're looking at PBMC engrafted mice, a labeled B-cell lymphoma co-engrafted. And in this case, the CAR-T that was created for this study was created from the same PBMC population that was co-engrafted into the mouse. So this is a, um, a matched type of CAR-T study. Um, and so it, you see the regular tumor outgrowth with no treatment in the controls as shown in black here. If you look at the green, this is the Raji cells with no PBMCs engrafted, just treated with the CAR T itself, and you see reduction in the tumor growth. If you look in blue, you've got engrafted PBMCs that were not transduced. And this is an important control for a couple of different reasons. The second reason will be on the second slide, but the first reason is, is that this PBMC population is not HLA matched to the Raji B cell lymphoma. And this is to show you that the PBMCs that are engrafted here are not having, at least within this time period of 12 days, is not having an allogeneic response against that Raji B cell lymphoma. So when you combine PBMCs in the CAR T, you have clearance of the tumor. And this is just a statistical data analyzing 10 and 12 days post to show that this is a statistically significant reduction in tumor growth response when you have CAR T as shown uh, in the green and the orange. Now, what's important about why, why is it that we're including these PBMCs? And the co-engraftment of the PBMCs is one, to better model what's happening clinically because you're, pay, having, you're, you're pulling the patient's T cells out, you're creating the cars and you're putting them back in. 
Um, so that's a matched setting. So we've got a matched CAR T to PBMC setting here. But also those human nucleated cells are able to amplify the cytokine release response to give a better sensitivity of that cytokine release toxicity level of response. So if we look at the control, RAGI plus PBMCs, there is no cytokine release. There's no activity against the tumor and there's no cytokine release. So that's a good control, either 24 or 48 hours. If you include the PBMCs co-engrafted with the CAR-T and you compare the green to the orange, the green again is without the PBMCs, you have an amplification of that cytokine release response, giving you greater sensitivity to measure the cytokine release response in conjunction with the response against the tumor. Now, in this last experiment I'm going to show you today uh, is just an example of not needing to necessarily use uh, irradiation to get engraftment of your PBMCs. And the reason you might want to do this, as I alluded to earlier, is if you're doing solid tumor studies in which you want to put the tumor on the flank or at an orthotopic site of your mouse, uh, you need to wait for that tumor to grow, and then you want to bring the PBMCs in, and you don't want to irradiate the tumor and confound your studies. You can just drop the PBMCs in, and what you can see is that you can establish uh, uh, engraftment of those PBMCs, although be it at a lower level of engraftment uh, in the double knockout mouse as compared to the NSG, but you do get engrafted cells. But the beauty of this is you get dramatically extended survival time. So this is out to like 75 days. So if you have a slow tu growing tumor, um, this gives you a lot of window of opportunity with which to work with those mice. Now, having said that, you have to be careful. If you dose these mice with too many cells, you will increase the level of engraftment but you also may run the risk of shortening your timeline by putting in too many cells and having mice succumb to graft versus host disease too early. The other thing that is important to know is that some particular donors are more are aggressive once they go into the mice and can lead to shorter timelines. So you need to take a lot of time to characterize dosage within without, ra within without radiation, total response. Um, not all PBMCs are going to have the same uh, engraftment and survival characteristics from one leukopact to the next. So this is, a, this is the tumor study that was done in this context where we're leaving out irradiation, we're engrafting these uh, tumors into the fat pad, uh, and then we start treating with either cetuximab, which is uh, an anti-EGFR monoclonal antibody treatment that's used clinically, and comparing that to the EGFR CD3 bispecific. And in this particular context, the study went out 45 days. The uh, bispecific antibody was uh, wave, oh, excuse me, let me point to that. It's, uh, the bispecific is in green. It was far superior than the cetuximab in terms of suppressing tumor growth. So these are the average data, and this is the individualized mice. But also very importantly, these mice maintain body weight and maintain health throughout the course of the 40 days of the study. So we have, you know, we start out this conversation with the title of this being a, a, a is a translational type of assay. Uh, if you look at the different therapeutics that we've run through this program, I haven't had a chance to talk about all of them, but almost all of them have either been looked at, at least in a clinical trial that was either halted due to toxicity, or they're examples of drugs that are being used clinically today. And the point of selecting these molecules is so that we can make correlations between the human clinical response and the response that we're seeing in these humanized mice. And we're seeing a great deal of overlap in terms of efficacy, cytokine response, the types of cytokines that are being released, et cetera. Um, so, and in fact, uh, if we look at these two molecules up here, utomilumab, which is a trial that's ongoing. This is a 41BB uh, agonist. Uh, in the PBMC environment, um, 
it didn't show high cytokine release in the clinic, and it didn't show high cytokine release in our model, in, in our setting with the PBMC engrafted mice. Uriumab was halted during its clinical trial due to safety. It had a relatively high cytokine release, enough that it was toxic to the patients, and that study was halted. It also led to some problems with some liver toxicity, and we also showed uh, observed liver toxicity in the mice uh, in, this, in our set of studies as well. So there's a lot of overlap uh, in the cytokines that are being released from these different platforms. So B stands for the bispecific studies. That's what B is here. Uh, A is if you treat the mice with anti-CD28 in the humanized setting, you get these types of cytokines. C would be CAR-T, and O would be if you treat with OKT3, which is an anti-CD3 monoclonal antibody. So there's, there's some molecules that only overlap with certain other types of treatment strategies. So there's overlap in terms of cytokine release when you get killing of the tumor. But there's also unique cytokines depending on the therapeutic that you're, you're using. There's also differences in the cytokines that are released, like IL-6 is only significantly upregulated in the context of high tumor target or high tumor burden in those kinds of situations. So that can influence the magnitude and the duration of the cytokines and ultimately what the toxicity is going to be on the recipient. Many of these cytokines have been reported in the literature, so the, the cytokines that we're seeing that are being released are also being uh, observed clinically. So in summary for chapter three, the human PBMC engrafted platforms do enable studies for immuno-oncology drug development that provide diverse donor-specific responses. This platform that has been developed by the JAX development uh, team has a novel humanized mouse platform for testing cytokine release that is rapid, sensitive, and reproducible for each given donor. And we've looked at a wide different type of molecules uh, and looked at the conjunction between uh, cytokine release and therapeutic efficacy of response. So I need to acknowledge those that were responsible for generating the JAX data, and those types of experiments are now being conducted by the JAX uh, in vivo services team in Sacramento, California. So if you are a drug developer and you are interested in running your molecule with these programs, please get in touch and we can help you with that. So in addition to those types of services, we have a wide range of other services at the Jackson Laboratory. We're not just a mouse distributor, we're also a service provider, and we'd be happy to help you uh, forward your research. So thank you.